What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here. And today I'm gonna to be looking at the Bentwood Vertical 63 Grinder. And I just wanna take a moment to give a huge thanks to Gary Horn Grinding and Brewing Solution. I'm gonna put links to their socials and website below. They're the ones through whom I got the Bentwood. You can get your Bentwood through them. They're incredible, I love them, and I just wanna thank them so much for giving me the opportunity to mess around with this machine and to create content based on it. So if you'll check out their YouTube in the coming weeks, I'll have a how-to dial in for espresso and filter on there. Look forward to that. But I just wanna thank them so much. This is just, this has been such a fun, a pleasure to work with. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please make sure you follow and check them out. In addition to all that, to Gary Horn, thank you so much. In addition to all that, I would just ask that you would like, subscribe, you know, check out my Patreon, do all that good stuff. And please make sure you know, I know you looked at the timestamp and you're like, oh my Lanta Lance, you went overboard. Um, I have time cues below. So go use them. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be direct to the point in each of those. It can be like a chapter book. You can watch a chapter a night or something. I want this to be an exhaustive, the most exhaustive on the internet, introduction, overview, dissection of the Bentwood Vertical 63. Thank you so much. Now let's get going. Now I received this grinder back in October and I have been messing around with it for months in order to have a fully formulated opinion on it before presenting it because this grinder is no joke. When it become, when it comes to like these bigger, much bigger uh, um, deposits of money for you all, I want to make sure that I'm covering everything thoroughly and then I have a really good understanding of the grinder, the burrs, the setup, the workflow, everything. So we're going to take this from the very beginning. First of all, Bentwood. It's designed by a guy named Manuel who is out in Zurich, Switzerland. He worked at Mount Koenig for a while, and then he started his own thing with the Bentwood back in 2016, 2017. Now, the name, where does that come from? Initially, Manuel wanted to call the company Blue Bottle, uh, and it's because Blue Bottle was the name of, or was the name of the first cafe in Austria in that Viennese culture. But obviously, Blue Bottle was taken, so he was thinking, what else could I call this company? Uh, Bentwood is what he came up with, and that's because those were the chairs that were that populated the first coffee shops, right? So these these chairs that you see in cafes still on when you see it in, in Paris on the movies or whatever, these these small chairs that had wood that was bent. So around the, uh, the 1800s or so, a German Viennese man figured out a way to bend wood and that's that's what that's that's what you got. So they became really popular at restaurants and cafes, and so this is named after that idea of bent wood chairs in cafes back in Vienna, Austria. Uh, Manuel has Austrian roots, and so it just made sense. Um, yeah, so that is the background of bent wood. I know a lot of people have been curious about that. There you go. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. So the bent wood is a massive grinder, as you can see. Some people make jokes that it's like Thomas the Tank Engine. Uh, it's, a, it's a big boy, but it only has 63 millimeter burrs, and we'll cover that here in a second. The motor is rated at 660 watts, so some would say that could be overkill, but it is a commercial grinder. So that's one of the first things I want to point out before we continue is remember, this is not a home grinder, it's commercial, though you will undoubtedly see people use it in a home setting, like me. So this is a commercial grinder, so when you see the bulk, there's a reason for that, and that is to lessen the heating up of the burrs. So there's a ton of aluminum in here, which slows down the heat up uh, of the burrs so that you, when you're going through a rush or whatever in a cafe, you're not going to have overly heated burrs, which will cause a lot of particle distribution errors, right? And on top of that, there are two fans inside to cool the burrs down. So there's a lot of money going into this grinder in order to make it commercial. So to be honest with you, the price tag is overkill for what it is for a home user, because a home user doesn't need the two fans. Home user doesn't need all of this bulk aluminum. The home user doesn't need uh, all of the programmed buttons. So although it is an incredible home grinder, it the price tag reflects a commercial use. So Manuel wasn't even thinking about making this for home users. It was first and foremost commercial but there's a huge explosion of people buying this for the home. And so I wanna, I'm gonna go over both how this works in a cafe setting as well as in a home setting. Okay, so we have that going. So it comes with this nice hopper. You have the face plate, we're gonna go ahead and turn it on. The on switch is in the back, it's just a little on off switch. In fact, I'll just show you real quick. All right, so we turn this around. On off switch right here, bing bing, all right. There's a the back vent for the fans, cool it off. Here we go. 
All right, so we have on here the face. It's a digital screen. We have a menu where we can go and we can change the shot times of our dosed buttons, okay? You can change the language, you can change the time. You hit save or you hit exit. So I'm just gonna go down, hit exit. Right there, check button for exit. So the blue buttons that were lit up just in, those are the buttons that you can use during this mode. All right, so we'll go back down to exit, check mark. All right, so you can program these down to one hundredth of a second, right? One hundredth of a second. So if you're on bar, you can go to shot. In shot one, I have it 4.30, but if I want to, I can go to 4.31, 4.32, 4.33, and so on all the way up to 4.38, whatever it may might be. You can program those shots to be whatever you need. Go back to the menu, go down to save, like so. It'll save it and it exits back to here. So you have option one, option two, this is manual. So it's just gonna go as long as it's hit. These are the up down buttons obviously, and yeah. All right, so we have a faceplate that's really intuitive. You have on top, which is right here. I'm gonna tilt this so you can see. So when we tilt it up, you see these numbers right here. And this is where you're changing your grind size by rotating this big wheel, okay? So the numbers that you see are in microns. So what this allows is if you get your touch point consistent, if you, let's say you're a, a roaster and you have a few shops, or you're a roaster and you do wholesale, and a lot of your clients grab one of these, you'll be able to calibrate your machine similarly, getting zero point to the same, and then you can tell them, we've been grinding this at 610 microns, and they'll be able to calibrate with you as far as the grind size goes, okay? So that's a really neat thing, uh, and I'm gonna show you why I love this, e even more than just the fact that it's in microns, I'm gonna show you here in a bit why this is my favorite dial I've ever used. Um, it's, it's so smooth and it's incredible. Anyway, then we have the chute down here. The chute pulls off really easily, bing, bing, like that. And then underneath we have a declumper. Um, obviously, you can't see that right now. I'll show it to you later. But this thing just pops in and out. There's some coffee in it because I was grinding right before we hit go. But it has these two little holes on the side and they just pop back in. So you just come back up under here. It's really easy to pull out. You just got to pop it back in. Boom, just like so. And there we go. Now you've probably noticed there is no portafilter holder on this machine. And, that, and you're like, well, if this is for a cafe, where's the portafilter holder? Well, uh, because so many people have requests for, oh, I need it to be able to grind into a bag, I need it to be able to grind into a dosing jar, I need it for this, that, and the other, the decision here was to leave it empty for everything. So you can put a bag under it to grind, you can put a dose jar, you can put anything under it. And it comes with this piece of metal, okay? And so there's instructions on the back on how you turn this into a portafilter holder and it's a simple bending of the metal. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, even though this is great to include, and you can put it right down there, we grab a portafilter, toss it on. One of the things is, obviously, because of the distance between the spout and that, you're gonna need something like a collar, so automatically that adds something to your workflow, because obviously, even with the declumper and everything, there's gonna be some static. You don't want it to be spraying all over the place. So you'll have to use a funnel so it doesn't spray. And, and anyway, on top of all that, this is just kind of flimsy. And if you wanna use like a bottomless portafilter on it, it doesn't hold nearly as well. This is obviously made for spouted. So it just, there are a lot of issues with this. I'm just not a big fan. Um, so I did find something I do prefer, and it is this made by Hero Heroia. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, but Heroia. Uh, and it has two hinges on it like so and then it has rubber on the edges for some friction. Anyway, this is a phenomenal investment if you have one of these. You can fit it any which way. If you wanna put a dose jar on it and you want it higher up, you can make a little table like that. I'm just, I'm a big fan of this, big, big fan. So with this, you can, you can use spouted or you can use bottomless. No problem, no worries. So with that, it needs to be a little bit more flat. There we go. So, and then it goes straight into it flat. All right. So those are some of the issues, obviously, with, with the machine as far as dispensing the grounds out. Now what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and take you inside the machine so we can take a look at what it, uh, so we can take a look at what makes this machine so unique. And I'm really excited to get to it because this is my favorite feature of the machine is looking on the inside. Get ready. I'm going to get my tools and we're going to get spelunking. All right, so the idea with this grinder initially was so that you could pull everything off without needing any type of tool, but you couldn't get it passed through all of the, or, or he couldn't get it passed through all the safeties, so he had to add some things that are just there. For instance, this little metal piece underneath 
It doesn't really serve a purpose. It's just kind of there. It blocks you from taking the face off, but it's because he had to do it, and it's just held on by one little Phillips head screw, which is just right here. And I'm just going to unscrew it real quick. I have mine loosely placed just so I don't lose it, but literally that's all the piece is. So it's one Phillips head screw, and it just kind of holds the front face plate on, okay? So we take that off. Now I'm going to turn the machine off, all right? Now what we do is you turn the face like so, and then it pulls right off. Boom, okay? Then you're gonna unplug the face, Woo! like so. So now we have the face off, all right? Just a simple plug, and it goes in and turns to lock in. So super easy to take on and off, all right? We're gonna set that to the side. And now we're gonna take a look right in here. So as you can see, there is some coffee re uh, retention. There's a way for coffee to kind of get through. So right here is where the auger is going and coffee, a little bit of coffee has gotten through. So we're gonna clean that up real quick, just so it's not a mess. But not, not much. Maybe, that was maybe two grams. And so now what you have are three screws right here that we're just gonna unscrew to take off. All right. All right, so we take this part off, and just remember that this little gap right here needs to be aligned on this side when we put it all back together. Next thing we're going to do, and this is a lovely part, you're gonna just make the grind coarser and coarser and coarser. Now, one of my favorite things about this grinder is how smooth the dial is, and I'm gonna show you why it's so smooth, and this was another big cost. They use a hunk of brass, with a ton, a ton of grooves in it. And this way, the grooves are so fine that it will not move while you're grinding. So you have seamless dialing in. Like you see how easy this is to turn? I'm about to show you how fine these, grind, these uh, grooves are. All right, we're almost off and there we go. Oh, not yet. There we are. All right, so. So you see all, all these grooves? That's what allows us to make those seamless dial-in motions without it losing its grind size. So that, those are what, th this, was a, this hunk of brass is not cheap, and that allows you to make just tiny little motions, okay? So I love that. All right, now we have the grinding chamber right here. As you saw, it kind of popped off. There's a spring behind it holding it on. Oh, there's one other thing I forgot to mention. Another way that, 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 that um, the dial is so smooth is this ball bearing. This ball bearing right here, this goes right there. So when you're turning, it makes it a smooth experience. Oh, so smooth. How do you get so smooth? Now, here is the grinding chamber. Are we ready? I feel like Willy Wonka about to open the chocolate factory. And here we go. Oh, yeah. Whoop, there's some retention. All right. There we are. There is one of the burrs right there. So I purposely did not clean this grinder out. I wanted to show what the retention looked like if you don't single dose. So the last, um, I put on my Instagram uh, recently, when I made this video recently, uh, what it looked like after 30 pounds of coffee, single dosing. So that means I had bellows on top, and I'll show you that when we go over bar flow for, for single dose. But I wanted to see what retention was like without bellows to see what it would be like for a cafe. And I've not even looked inside yet. I pulled that out and y'all are, are seeing this first before me. So I wanted to see what retention was like. Let's take a look. Oh wow, that's really not bad. Take a look in there. That's really not bad at all. Here, I'm gonna knock out any retention here. I gave it a thorough cleaning prior to doing the hopper on top. So all of this came from the last 15 to 20 pounds I put through it. Oh, yeah, that's what I was looking for. All right, so I'm going to clean this off. We're going to see how many, how much grounds there are. All right, let's get all these grounds out. See if we can get a visual. And like I said, I put about 10 or 15 pounds of coffee through it with the hopper lid on. So without single dosing, without bellows. All right, so there's all that. And let's see what all we can get from out of here. There's really not much in here, to be honest with you.
All right. All right, I'm just going to scoot this off and weigh what, what, whoops, that fell. All good. All right, so I'm going to kind of just scoop this around, weigh what's right here, just to just have an idea. This obviously isn't perfect, but we're going to check it out anyway. All right, so we got that. And zero this out. All right, so obviously this isn't all the retention. There are still little grounds, but that is, good grief, that can't be right. Yeah, it's about half a gram is what it's showing. Half a gram after about 10, 10 pounds of coffee I've put through this is what I could scrounge up. And as you can see, there's not much left in there. All right, now I'm going to shove this brush up here where the declumper is. Okay, so there's some more right there. All right, so there we go. This piece is magnetic, so we can take this off. We can toss this in. Let's see where we're at. All right, so still right under a gram. And it, I mean, there's still some in there. So even let's say two grams. Two grams out of 10 pounds is pretty impressive. This is a very, very, very low retention grinder once it's nice and seasoned. I've put, at, uh, by now, I've put about 40, 45 pounds through this grinder. All right, so let's take a look on the inside. What's uh, another hugely unique thing about this grinder, and then we'll get into the burrs, is this auger. And I'll show you an overhead view of this when I'm grinding coffee. But this auger is very specifically created to act as a pre-breaker. Now, you may be asking, what does that mean? Well, typically pre-breakers are actually on the burrs. They're kind of the big ridges at the beginning so that it crushes the bean, uh, cuts the bean prior to getting crushed by the finishing teeth and whatnot. But this is acting as a pre-breaker. So it's essentially grinding the coffee before the coffee's ground. So the beans fall in right here. So obviously here's the, uh, here's the hopper. Beans fall in here. But the burrs are just offset back here, okay? So from a side view, the beans fall in here, but the burr is back here. So for it to get from here to here, the auger has ridges on it. And those ridges break the bean up. And again, I'll show you that in a second whenever we grind some coffee. And caters it back because of the uh, corkscrew effect, right? So as that corkscrew is going, it pushes the beans to the burrs. And then it falls through the vertically mounted 63 millimeter burrs. So 63 mils. Here we are. This is th now. This is a fun fact. So if you're an, uh, if you're a grinder nerd, you know the name Kieber. Kieber is one of the most well known burr designers ever and recently passed. Uh, it is said. I don't have confirmation here, but the rumor is these were the last set of burrs that he designed prior to passing, which is kind of a cool legacy to leave on. Um, of course, you know, fact check me there, but that's kind of that's what I've been hearing. Um, but yeah, so this is a, what's called a blind burr, meaning there are no screws in it. So you may be asking, why is it 63 mils? Why not 64? 64 is bigger. In reality, there's more surface area on this 63 millimeter burr than a 64 when you take into account the screw holes in a 64 mil, okay? So these are the burrs that are on there, and then we can take it off to take, uh, you may be asking, well, is it magnetic? Is it magnetized like the, Lin uh, like the Weber Works uh, EG1? No, it is not. I cannot pull that off, and it's because it is set in place. That's the wrong size Allen wrench. It is sat in place by these massive screws from behind, which I think is brilliant. I know that my friend Kyle Ramage, the what 20, like 17 or so U.S. barista champion who worked for uh, Malkunig USA for a while, does not like magnetic burrs. He says, you know, grounds can get behind them and they can uh, misalign, which is a very valid point. Um, the same argument cannot be said here. These are tightly holding that burr onto place, into place, onto place, into place, so that that is not an issue. So these are massively long screws that you have to access with an Allen wrench, so obviously taking them off can be a pain, but, uh, and I'm a little wary to take them off because I have this aligned, but, so we take it off like so. Oh cool, the shim stayed there, nice. So that's what the, bur the burr looks like on the back, okay? And that's where we're at here. So while I have this off, let me remember where I have this. I'm going to just wipe the grounds that is there, which that's all that was there but you always want to wipe off any dust or particulates or anything before replacing the burr. Now, because the tolerances of this are so tight, like look at this. See how tight that is? You have to go in at a, there's only one way to really put it in. If you're at an angle at all, it won't go in. Super tight. 
The tolerances on this grinder are insanely tight and it's so that it is aligned upon arrival. And I will say it is very, it is very, it is more aligned than any other grinder I've ever received upon arrival. Fact. I have never had a grinder as aligned as this upon arrival based off of the market test, which obviously is not ideal because it doesn't replicate what the birds are like under load, but it does a good job. This has been one of the more aligned grinders I've ever, it, the most aligned grinder I've ever had upon reception. Uh, and whenever you lock the burrs to zero, which means at zero you have the burrs locked, okay? <clears throat> the touch point, when they first touch, happened when I got this out of the box at 70. After I seasoned, the touch point happened at 60 microns. After I shimmed just this burr, just the uh, stationary burr, the rotary burr is the back burr near the motor. When I shimmed this with just these, this little piece of aluminum, I was able to get touch point to 20. So I was able to align it even better than what it was out of the box. Okay, so we gotta make sure that these holes are aligned. So this can be a pain, is making sure the holes are aligned, but you're not, ain't nothing getting behind these. So we're just gonna replace these screws and screw the burr tightly back in. All right, so I have the burr back on, everything's screwed in. Now I'm gonna just put it all back together. So all we're gonna do is make sure that the wire can feed through. So we start by putting this in which again is very tight, kind of difficult to put in. So you have to make sure everything's lined up perfectly. Make sure that's going. And then we put it right on those pins right here. Boom, boom, and boom. Put it in there flush. See that spring is holding it in. All right, next thing we do is we're going to replace this big boy. So the first thing I like to do is I like to go ahead and place the bearings on. All right, so now we're just going finer and finer, which takes a little bit of time because how many grooves there are. We're going to go all the way until the burrs lock and that's where we set zero point. Okay. So we're going, we're almost there and there we're locked. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little Allen wrench and I'm going to find on this second piece somewhere up oh, right here, right there. There's a little hole. You gotta get an Allen wrench, put it in, and we're gonna loosen that. And what that does is it separates this piece from the actual turn, okay? And when it's separated, you can change the numbers on top, like so. See, I'm not actually turning them big wheel, I'm just turning the numbers to calibrate back to zero. Boom, like so. And then we're just going to Screw this out, this uh, little little guy back in. All right, so now we're back at zero, and we just have to replace a couple more pieces. So remember when we put this on, you want the groove, whoops, right there. So we're gonna put this here. Go and put the screws in. We got that back on, boom. Make sure that wire's pulled out because we have to plug the face in now. So here we go, we're just gonna take this, Oh, it's gonna be hard to hide it. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it like this. Take that, and I'm gonna snap my fingers and it'll be back on. All right, and now we have it all back together so you have a good idea of what's on the inside. Let me take it off zero so I don't tear those burrs up. And uh, yeah, so that is what the inside of the Bentwood looks like. Now we're going to actually grind some coffee. I know you've been waiting for it, so here we are. So I'm gonna turn this on. So when you turn on the machine, the first thing you're gonna hear are the fans. So you hear that? So there is a noise to it, but obviously in a cafe, it's not gonna, it, you won't hear a thing. Uh, at home, there are a lot of people who are disconnecting the two fans inside because you don't need them at home. You're not going through arduous volume. So there is the fan inside uh, and that's what's gonna be making the noise. Then when you turn it on, of course. Oh, there was some more attention actually. That was probably with the declumper. De Look at that, a little bit more attention. Still not ridiculous though. And again, that was without single dosing. This is still zeroed. So now we're at 1.2 grams of retention. All right, so that's how we turn on. That's what it sounds like. Boom, and that, so that was probably all just caught in the shoot up there. All right, so a lot of people are, are going to wonder, because there's a declumper inside, a lot of the home enthusiasts that have this grinder argue to take the declumper off. People, uh, I argue, keep the declumper on, especially if you are in a cafe setting. This is impossible to use if you're doing espresso in a cafe setting without the declumper. And I'm gonna show you a test right now. I'm gonna put it to 
an espresso grind size, which will be around 200. That'll be fine. I'm gonna put some coffee in the hopper and we're gonna watch what happens. We're gonna watch what happens with the declumper and then I'm gonna take the declumper off. All right, which is a very easy thing to do. So I'm gonna take this and this is grinding at uh, 200 microns with the declumper installed. Are you ready? We're gonna look at the chute right here and go. Whoops, I have to open the hopper obviously. All right, so initially they were spraying because it was all clean, but now that, there we go. So of course there's expected sprayage from static. There, that's not really something you can really help much. But for the most part, after, it, after grounds have gotten in there and have accumulated, it is much, much more controlled. See that? All right, now I'm gonna take the declumper out. All you gotta do to take the declumper out is you're gonna get underneath with like a pair of pliers or something. So you're gonna go up there, grab the declumper and pull it on out. There it is. That's all it is right there, this little guy. All right, now watch what's gonna happen. All right, same thing, take two. You have to have the declumper. I mean, look at that. Okay, mess everywhere. It just gets stuck, the static gets stuck up there. What this little thing does is it helps to reduce static and it declumps. So this is very important if you're in a cafe. Do not take this out at home. You can leave it and take it out. I left it in whenever I made my post where it had nearly zero grounds inside because I was using bellows, I had this in. So I don't see a need to take it out, but you know, you do you. If you're in a cafe though, I would not take this out. Okay, so I'm gonna clean this up and then we're gonna get back to it. All right, so to wrap up the cafe workflow, what I recommend cafes doing if they're using a porta filter is you can just put an Akaya Pearl right on that, all right? Then I'll take, I would take one of these Herioras if you're doing straight into a porta filter. Take your porta filter, lay it on here. And of course, you're going to need, as I said earlier, you're going to need a collar, though it's not terrible when you have the declumper in. But if you have a collar, you have to do a little wiggle room to get it underneath. Again, it's not, I don't think it's 100%. You saw how little spraying there was once there were coffee grounds going through. So maybe it's not 100% necessary to get a collar, but it will certainly help have no spray. But essentially you can grind, you set your timer here. I have it set for 18 grams and it does really well. You can double check with uh, the scale. So, and then I like to set the second button to 0.5 seconds and just zzz, zzz, whenever I need a little bit extra. Anyway, all right. So that kind of wraps up the workflow for a cafe. Now I'm going to transition this to a single dosing home machine right now. All right, so all I did is I took the hopper off. There's a nice screw over here. I unscrewed that and then I have a friend who 3D printed me this little single dosing 3D file thing. Anyway, and then I have, I always plug this, this little bellows that I bought on Amazon. I use it for everything. It's the best in the world. It's so good. I mean, it's so good. And it fits perfectly in the thing that he printed me. So I have one of these, but watch this. This is why bellows are so important. I've already bellowed some out and I regret not doing it on camera. But when you don't have a declumper, there's gonna be a lot of coffee left in there. Check this out. Look at all that. Look at all that. It's still coming. Still coming. That declumper, de-static little tool is very important. Look at all this. Perfect. All right, now I'm gonna clean that up and we'll be right back. Yeah, so this bellows, I highly recommend when you're using this consistently with RDT, which just means Ross Droplet Technique, you will get virtually no retention. Granted, as Samo, Dr. Samo out in Zurich pointed out, there's no such thing as getting exactly 20 and exactly 20 out because you're gonna lose a percentage of that when you're grinding to gases. But for the most part, you're getting essentially everything you're putting in, you're gonna get out using bellows and RDT with minimal, 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 minimal retention. So uh, I always weigh out almost exactly to whatever dose I need and I get out what I need. So um, I definitely recommend the bellows. I recommend keeping the declumper in there. Of course, you don't have to if you're using RDT and if you're using a bellows. Anyway. What a lot of people have done at home is they have, uh, like I said, unplugged those fans and, and then you have a really nice single dose uh, grinder. Now let's talk about taste. Um, <clears throat> so if you've, if you've skipped here from the, the chapters below and you skip straight to taste, 
welcome. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will be doing that because that first bit was a lot. Um, I'm gonna just briefly talk about the taste and I will brew one cup of coffee versus another grinder I think it's most similar to and its flavor profile. We'll taste that and that'll be kind of it. But the, the burr set on this is really unique. It's kind of similar actually to those Gebby burrs I showed in my budget grinder showdown as far as the geometry itself. Um, and they produce really nice cups. So the fact that it has that pre-breaker, as I talked about the auger, you're getting essentially a double grind, which increases your particle distribution. Now, I have seen uh, laser diffractions of this, and it is a very impressive curve. It's not like the second coming or anything like that. It's nothing that is unbelievable. Um, it would, uh, 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 the, the main one I've seen is a, is a comparison between the EK-43 with the normal filter burrs in it versus this, and this does crush that set of burrs on espresso. But the speculation, I've not seen a diffraction yet, but the speculation is if you had the Turkish burrs in the EK and had it aligned, they would be roughly similar. But again, this is a 63 millimeter burr set versus 98. It has a lot more power for its size. It comes with a lot uh, tighter tolerances. I really, really, really love this. Anyway, the, uh, the, the, the coffee that comes off of this, let's talk about that. So if you look at those two main styles of burrs, the, the unimodal versus that, uh, the, the high uniformity, what this gives you is it doesn't quite give you the clarity of that unimodal burr. I prefer the clarity and the cups from the unimodal because I am obsessed with clarity, but it gives you body akin to the high uniformity burrs. So you're getting all that body and sweetness from the high uniformity, and you're getting a lot more clarity than the high uniformity, not quite to the multi-purpose, okay? So when you're doing filter coffee, you're gonna get really nice body, you're gonna get a really nice sweetness, and you're gonna get some pretty pretty clear some pretty clear notes so if you're tasting something and it should have blackberry you're gonna taste the blackberry is it gonna sing a crystal clear blackberry like those unimodal burrs will well no in fact I've not found any burr set that really sings the clarity that those unimodals do but this gives you an incredible clarity without sacrificing body and sweetness which is a difficult thing to find okay as for espresso, I've been hearing a lot of weird things on home forums like it only performs well under certain pressures or certain flows. I've not had that experience and this does a great job along all of the pressures and flows. I've done so many different styles of shots on the Decent Espresso machine, especially as I was prepping for a separate video. I use this exclusively filling the hopper up and doing all different types of espresso shots. Now it does shine, in my opinion, most under those traditional style shots but it can do low flow incredibly well as well because it has it, it allows you to do these, these shots that are typical of those more unimodal burrs. It allows you to do them with more body. So you're not gonna, you'll get a little bit more astringency, I have found, but it is a worthy trade-off to get the body and sweetness along with that clarity that typically you're sacrificing body and sweetness for to get the clarity. So, these produce really juicy cups, really nice cups. The best way that I can describe the cut profiles from this is actually relating it to the Didding Lab Sweet burrs. Now, you may be asking, what do those burrs look like? Well, good for you. I have them right here. So, these are the Didding Lab Sweet. What's really cool is these look identical, but in reality, one has nine pre-breakers and one has 10. Um, and the idea behind this is something to do with, with audio frequency, so it changes the sound of the grinder. Anyway, uh, these have become incredibly well known. They, um, well, I think the story is that th th these burrs, uh, the, these design burrs were found in an old warehouse and they refinished them, recast them, and that's where the Lab Sweets came from. But regardless of where they came from, they are very, uh, very famous in, in, this, in the coffee shop world for filter coffees. They make really sweet, really heavy bodies with clarity. It's kind of like what a lot of people see as the perfect storm when it comes to uh, espresso and filter. So anyway, I actually have over here a Didding filter grinder with Lab Sweets installed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to brew a cup of coffee using the bent one. I've already done, um, uh, the, I've already measured the sizes and make them, made them as equal as possible as well as similar drawdowns and similar extractions. And I'm gonna taste both of them and I'm gonna talk about kind of where one may beat the other and, and, and you know compare the two. So I'll get back to you when those are brewed up and all right, well, as this is draining, I'm gonna talk about a couple things that I neglected to mention earlier. This machine runs at 1400 RPM. It's not variable RPM, which is typical of the end game grinders for the home users. But uh, the company thought it made sense to keep it at where they thought all, all coffees tasted best so as to not confuse coffee shops. Again, this is a commercial machine. This was not intended necessarily to be a home machine, even though many are using it that way, including myself, and I'm loving it. Um, in addition to that, I did want to address something that I have seen also online, some claims that this makes more spherical grounds. That is 
and this may be the first time you've heard that, but um, there have been, there's been speculation that this makes more spherical, spherical grounds, which allows for a higher and more even extraction. Now I do have some microscopic imaging from Bentwood that I'm gonna put right here and right here, right here. Um, but I want you to know that I was talking with, uh, again, Samo, the, the uh, scientist from Zurich, and in his, um, in his data that he's collected from the EK and from the Bentwood and from other uh, tests that he's done, there was no like evidence that the, the, the difference in sphericity was enough to make it statistically relevant. So it's probably not more spherical, but the, 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 those microscopic images are cool and the idea is cool. But just so you know, anyway, th these are done brewing. There, uh, I matched up the grind sizes, the drawdown times. Everything's pretty much identical. They both brewed and right at the same amount of time. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna give them a taste. I'm not gonna do this blind only because um, they're not that similar. It's very easy for me to tell the difference between these two. I'm just trying to give you the best equivalent to these burrs that I can think of. And this is, this is the best I can think of. So right here I have the lab sweets. And right here I have the Bentwood. And I did both of them at the same, obviously everything was the same, 12 to 200 like I usually do with my Kono Brewer. It gives me the most consistent brews. So we're just gonna taste these two right here. Boom. All right, so this one is Lab Sweet. So this one has, it's very, very, very juicy. I, I brewed one of the George Hal Kenyas that I've gotten recently. Really, really juicy. The the black currant's on point. There's really nice berries coming through. It's it's the the clarity isn't like at an all time high. It's just juicy. So whenever for me when I'm describing something as juicy, there's not a lot of, in, of inherent clarity. Whenever there's a lot of clarity, I typically don't get as much juiciness. Right? It's more floral and it's more complex. And there's uh, more of those fruits that are popping through, but they're very clean. Whereas for me, in my mind, when I think of juice, I'm thinking of, you know, when you squeeze an orange, you get the orange juice out. It's very juicy. It's very, um, makes you salivate. It's, um, it's, it's a similar to what phosphoric acid and like Coca-Cola does to your tongue. So we're going to do this. This one's a Bentwood. This one has more complexity to it. This has more clarity. Um, the bodies are comparable. But this one has, I would say the Bentwood has a smidge less sweetness than the Lab Sweets do, but it has a little bit more clarity. So that's kind of the trade-off you get between this and something like the Lab Sweet. But keep in mind, this is 63 mils. Lab Sweets are 80 mils, okay? So I'm going to take it from a cup because obviously from the spoon is a different taste experience from the cup. This is a good coffee in general. Between these, I mean, it's hard to say which one I prefer because uh, that's not helpful as much to you all since I have a very specific preferences. Uh, I have very specific preferences, but objectively, they both probably would score like similarly if you were to make an objective criteria score sheet. It's just this one is heavier on like the juiciness, whereas this is heavier on the, and the sweetness, this is heavier on clarity and um, yeah, about similar body though. So between the two, I might lean with this cup, but of course this is one brew. It's a single brew off. It's not typical of every time. And I could always epitomize each for a different ratio for them to bring out, uh, their best. So this does have florals though, which are kind of lost in this because this is straight up just like juice. Um, this one has much more complexity. Anyway, I just wanted to do that little test, do a little talk through of that because I wanted to show you what they kind of taste like uh, and, and that's the best comparison I can make to be honest with you. There's no other grinder out there that I have found that replicates the taste of the Bentwood. And honestly, that was a plan of Manuel at the beginning was to have something that wouldn't be copied immediately. So these are spe very specific burrs. It's a very specific system and how, uh, how it uses that auger as a pre-breaker as you saw in that video. And running at 1400 RPM, which is, uh, a a, a typical RPM to run at, that's what the fellow Ode runs out. I'm telling you, it, whenever you're looking at those SSPs, if you're familiar with those, it really is kind of, here's high, uh, the high uniformity, here's multi-purpose, it's somewhere in between the spans between the two. So keep that in mind. If that's something that you, you dig, okay, cool. Um, this does filter and espresso really well, better than maybe, I would say better than 
Better, maybe there's two other grinders that do both espresso and filter as well as this. Mostly your burr geometry really puts you, pigeonholes you into one specific side, either filter or espresso. This allows you to do both. Switching between espresso and filter is super easy. I do recommend, however, tossing a couple beans in. I do that with every grinder though. If you're switching from filter to espresso and vice versa, I always recommend dumping three, four beans in, just kind of clear it out, get it ready to go. I highly recommend getting these bellows for this grinder. And um, yeah, that's, uh, I, think that's, I think that's more than enough for an exhaustive look at the Bentwood. I hope, you know, if you watch this whole video as opposed to skipping through with the chapters below, hit me with, uh, hit me with I don't know, say, bent wood or bent coulda, bent woulda, bent shoulda, bent did. No, you don't have to do all that, but that would be actually really funny if you did. Um, this coffee's really good. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe. Make sure you check out my Patreon uh, so that you can get access to the Discord. I give away like everything on there that I have. And um, yeah, check out my other videos. Thanks for the support. Um, let's go to the moon. I hope you brew something tasty today. Cheers.